Um, Greg is no stranger to Stony Brook. <laughs> he was a faculty member here from 93 to 99, and he left and returned to Duke where he had received his PhD earlier. Um, it's fair to say that he's uh, one of the earlier founders of the field that has become Evo Devo. So with that, oh, and your title is um, Embryos and Evolution, 150 Years of Reciprocal Illumination. I'm live. Okay, so uh, I want to start um, with the same thing that inspired Darwin, which is the incredible beauty, diversity, and um, just plain stunningness of the natural world. Now, for most of the history of evolution, when people thought of it as a study, the kinds of things they were studying, the entities, were the things we're looking at here. Morphology, physiology, behavior, distributions, life histories, things like that. But of course, for the last 50 years, we've also been able to study a different kind of entity, which is the genetic underpinnings of what we're looking at here. However, both of these disciplines, or subdisciplines, if you will, within evolutionary biology, have proceeded along largely independent tracks in the sense that we don't know much about how they're linked. And what I'm going to argue today is that. That is what Evo Devo really tries to do, is to, is to provide the linkage, the material linkage between changes in the genome and changes in traits. So, and I, the reason I pose this question is I think there's a lot of um, ambivalent feeling about what Evo, what if anything, Evo Devo really brings to the table that helps us understand the process of evolution better. So I'm going to really make two arguments today. The first is that, that really the, the, the substantive contribution that Evo Devo can make has really only emerged quite recently uh, relative to the antiquity of the field. Um, and that second, what that is, what that contribution is, is really a clear understanding of the material basis, not the in principle basis, but the material basis for the connection between changes in the genome and changes in traits. And what I mean by that, I hope, will become clear as I go through the talk. So what I'm going to start off by doing is giving you a highly opinionated quick tour of the history of Evo Devo. And it actually starts well before my birth, um, well. Um, and uh, this isn't meant to be synoptic or comprehensive or scholarly. It's, it's, it's just to give you a flavor for how diverse the approaches have been that link studies of, of embryos and evolution. So um, the first thing, and one that probably many of you know about, is that there is this sort of parallel between the unfolding of development, embryonic development, and the evolutionary history of a group. Now, I don't think this is the most intellectually satisfying um, aspect of Evo Devo, but it's the most ancient. This, this parallel was actually noted by Aristotle. The kind of golden era um, was in, in, in the uh, early uh, 19th century. Um, Meckel and Serres were, were two people among many who talked about this. Um, and really, the, the apogee was, was Haeckel um, and his biogenetic law. And you've, you've all seen um, the iconography that goes with this, the woodcuts that Haeckel produced. Um, another aspect. Of, of embryos in evolution is the one that Darwin brought, which is embryos provide evidence for common descent. And Darwin comments on that. This is a, a, a picture from uh, Descent of Man. It's the first figure in the book. Um, and Darwin points out how similar, how much more similar embryos are than the adults to which they give rise. And this is elaborated on later uh, in time within, for instance, uh, Walter Garstang's hypothesis for the origin of chordates based on essentially taking an echinoderm-like larva and morphing it into something else that could then be, uh, become a chordate ancestor. So in other words, trying to sort of connect the dots for common descent through the study of embryos when you, it's hard to do that by looking at the adults. Now, Haeckel reappears in a different guise because he not only was fascinated by this temporal parallel between development and evolution, but he literally thought of the terminal addition of steps onto the end of development as a mechanism of evolution. That's how he described it. And this notion of terminal, this notion of terminal addition 
led him to the notion that there were literal ancestors that looked like the embryos of today. And the most famous ones are his Blastea and Gastrea, which he thought were real, you know, really living animals. And, and I'm not saying that early animals didn't have a simple form, but he literally thought they were in the form of modern embryos. Um, this idea didn't really last very long. Um, I think people sort of recognized that this was a little bit kooky. There were, even at the time um, Haeckel was sort of pushing these ideas, people realized that there were massive exceptions to what he called recapitulation. Now, a completely different group of people were interested in development from an evolutionary perspective because they were interested in life history evolution. And one of the really striking things people studying marine invertebrates discovered was that often larvae that give rise to adults look really different from those adults. So this is just three examples. Here's a sea urchin larva. Here's a, a, an ascidian tadpole. And in all of these cases, the adults look utterly different. From this came a very important realization, and one that I think many evolutionary biologists maybe still don't fully comprehend, which is that development is not just a way to make an adult. There is, you have to live long enough to get there. And as a result, many aspects of development are themselves adaptations for coping with environmental stresses, for dispersal, for defense from predators, and all sorts of things like that. And so understanding why these larvae look so different from these adults is really something you have to understand in the context of evolutionary ecology. So that was an interesting and important realization. Like deja vu all over again, or recapitulation recapitulating itself, we're back to temporal parallels. When Gould published uh, his book in 1977, um, Ontogeny and Phylogeny, and, and basically made the case that we could take life history evolution and temporal changes in development, and they actually had things to say to each other. And this was an important recognition as well, and I think particularly for the paleo community, this was, a, was an important book because you could do this with fossils, and, and that, that was a very fruitful time. But it was really on the threshold of, oh, sorry, there's one more phase I have to go over um, before we get to the big stuff. Uh, the other thing that happened around the same time was this notion that development could somehow impose or could shape, let's just say, variation. So in other words, because of the way development unfolds, mutations don't all have the same sort of random effects. But lots of different mutations and lots of different genes might end up producing the same set of phenotypic consequences because of the buffering or canalization capabilities of development. So this became known as developmental constraints, but Per Albert, who was a big proponent of this, was also quite clear about the fact that, that you could think of this in the converse sense, too, that the structure of development could actually provide certain kinds of opportunity for particular directions of change in, in, in trades. But in the, in the 1970s and 1980s, there was something brewing outside of evolutionary biology that ended up having a much bigger impact and I think really set the stage for what Evo Devo is today. And that is developmental genetics. It, it was possible really for the first time in the 70s and 80s to start doing large scale forward mutagenesis screens. And out of those screens were coming genes with very specific consequences for development and not long after, people got to the point where they could start cloning those genes, and that's when all hell busted loose. And so that's what I really want to talk about next. And some of the, the, the early, the, some of the people that really recognize how that information for developmental genetics could inform us about evolution were Rudy Raff and Tom Kaufman. This book published in 1983 um, was sort of set the stage. Uh, Sean Carroll sort of jumped in a little bit early, a little bit later rather, and um, there's lots and lots and lots of other people who've been involved with this since, but they were some of the, the early practitioners. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, what happened was Evo Devo um, blossomed and then it crashed and burned, and um, I'll tell you why. So the first thing is that you have to understand there were evolution and development, there have been relationship issues right from the start. Okay, so some of you may remember this book, which was published in 19, it's not, it's not a biology book at all, this is pop psychology, okay. But my wife made me read it, and it was, um, it's actually a pretty good book. Um, so, anyway, so here's the problem. You have to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna basically make the argument that, that development and, and, and evolutionary biology really have a lot that they can help each other with. But they're starting from two really, really different positions. So here's caricature. Not, this is not a quote from the book. I want to make this clear. 
caricature of the way a developmental biologist thinks about an evolutionary biologist. They do not think about molecules. When a, when a population geneticist thinks about a gene, it's like an A or a little a. That is not a flipping gene, okay? So that's one problem. Um, they never even think about how genes actually produce traits. They just know they do, right, and take it on faith. Their concept of a gene is decades out of date. True. They can't possibly understand how traits evolve with that kind of mental handicap, right? On the other hand, evolutionary biologists, like developmental biologists, do not understand variation. Absolutely true. Their typological thinking is laughable. Yes, it is. And don't get me started on their lack of quantitative skills. When I was a graduate student, I was told, really, literally, by my advisor, if you need to use statistics to analyze your experiment, you didn't design it very well. So, so and that's, that's a quote. So, so there's really, these, these two disciplines are really starting from very different places. Okay, so how did they start getting together in, in a more substantive way? Well, the first thing that really got things going was when people began to be able to positionally clone and sequence those genes that were coming out of the forward mutagenesis screens. And this blew our minds. I was alive at this point and I could not believe it. Okay, so what happened is you've got a gene like Notch that comes out of a screen for wing shape in Drosophila. So there's the name of the, the gene is named for this phenotype. Uh, this has been, this is a classic mutation, been known for a long time. Um, when C. elegans began to be used as a model organism, forward genetic screens are produced. There's, there's a, a locus called LIN12 that produces this multivulva phenotype. So these, these, gene, these uh, nematodes have lots of little vulvae on them. Um, and when this gene was cloned, it was abundantly clear that it was an orthologue of Notch. Okay, now why is this surprising? So first of all, the simple observation that some of the same genes are being used to regulate the development of organisms that look totally different from each other, right? That was the first hard thing for us. And, and these days, this doesn't sound at all surprising to you, but nobody saw this coming, I guarantee you. But the more amazing thing is the same genes involved in producing a trait that is completely different. And this just got worse. Another example where, of course, the, and most famously, members of the Hox complex, here's Antennapedia, putting, turning an antenna into a leg. Um, mutations in, in the same kinds of genes on the vertebrate body axis result in sort of homeotic transformations as well, but they also do lots of other things. So same genes, different traits in really different organisms. And of course, and you all know the story, I mean, this just got worse. There were more and more and more and more examples of this. Not only are the genes widespread, but their expression domains are topologically kind of similar, and often they are producing similar kinds of structures. So um, PAC6, which is essential for vertebrate eye development, turns out to be the ortholog of eyeless, which in Drosophila is essential for eye development, even though compound and camera eyes are clearly not, do not share a common evolutionary origin as organs. So all kinds of interesting stuff like this. And this was sort of stupefying to everybody. Now, the other thing that got us excited was, as, as a field, when EvoDiva was kind of coalescing, or the new EvoDiva was coalescing, is that, that paleontologists, we could start talking to paleontologists about fun stuff, like fossils, and the Burgess Shale, and everybody got interested in body plans. Because, of course, these genes were laying out the fundamental architecture of the body plan. So we really thought we had a moment when we could sort of take what we're learning from developmental genetics and talk to paleontologists and actually figure out some of these big phenotypic transitions in evolution. Okay. And there are people in this room, and I'm looking at some guys over there, and some, who remember this. This was really fun. Okay. And so we entered this era of what you might think of as Hox mania, right, where people were going around and cloning out Hox genes or other developmental regulatory genes from pretty much any kind of weird organism they could lay their hands on. And so we had these sort of maps of this is the membership of the Hox cluster in a fly, and here's an Anicophora and a nematode preapulate. It was fun, but really, I mean, that doesn't really tell us why these two creatures look different from each other. That's what we really wanted to know. So the next step was to move beyond just simply cloning the genes and sequencing them to actually trying to assess their function. And so we, people began to look at expression domains, and this is sort of an idealized representation of the extent of expression of these different members of the Hox complex along the body axis. And yes, you really get the sense that they are providing a kind of address code for 
the different segments and giving them their identity. And we now know that's true. And this has actually been a fundamental realization. That's one important way that morphology is, you know, undergoes diversification is by changes in the distribution of the expression of these regulators. Okay, and then people did other stuff. So there is this notion that we could maybe take these gene expression patterns and the similarities between flies and mice, and if they're really, really important, so they're functionally critical and they seem to be conserved, then we can back calculate to their common ancestor and figure out what it looked like, because those, those features must have been there in the ancestor as well. And so this helps us maybe distinguish between having a very simple bilaterian ancestor versus a very, very fancy one. And people began to make even fancier, ever fancier and fancier ones. I mean, these things had wings, they could sing, they could compose poetry. <laughs> and it was, it was pretty clearly there was something wrong with doing this. And I, I'm not, I don't mean to sort of lampoon anybody in particular, but just, just one example, sort of this is what the ancestor would have looked like, and here's where their genes were, and you know. Um, this kind of business went on for a while, and this began to make some of us pretty uneasy because there was a disconnect between thinking that you could take, uh, whoops, um, excuse me just a second, um, that you could take, uh, anybody know where an outlet here? take this out of my time? <laughs> Can you reach here by a chance? Oh, yeah, here. Well, just plug it in over there. Just just take it to the... Right, right, right there. By your desk. Um, okay, so the problem is that, that people began to think that just because a gene is expressed in a certain part of the body in one organism and a certain part of the body in another organism, that those things were necessarily homologous and that we had to eventually get to the point where we realized that that was not true simply through reductio ad absurdum. So we kind of ditched this. But there was even a bigger problem with this enterprise that we entered into and in, in really mostly in the 1990s. Uh, and it's shown here. These embryos have a lot of topological similarities in terms of where key regulatory genes are being expressed, but they give rise to really, really different adults. And so I call this the Hox paradox in the sense that how do you get the fly to look different from a mouse if their embryos are, you know, kind of you blur your eyes and they're the same? I mean, I know they're not really, but, but that, was the, that was sort of the impression you got looking at them. So how do you take something that's topologically laid out so similarly and get two such really different organisms. So this was, this was a problem that we had to solve. And we knew the in-principle solution, and I'll, 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 I'll tell you about that now. Because it's actually not really a mystery. The, the mystery is, not, is, 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 only, uh, is, is only virtual because really the answer is that there's rewiring of the interactions between those key regulator, regulators and the genes that they're regulating. So now I have to tell you a little bit about why, for developmental biologists, this was a, a no-brainer moment, because they know that regulation, I mean, that's what development is, is regulation. So um, let me just kind of give you back up a little bit in time and give you some background on that. So um, <coughs> 48 years ago, Jacob and Minode published their, their paper describing the lac operon. Of course, won a Nobel Prize for this, and that's sort of what people remember. But, they, but not only did they discover that there are functional sequences in the genome that don't code for proteins, this was the first time that had been, or RNAs, this is the first time that had ever been demonstrated, right? But they recognized actually in a separate publication the same year that there were really interesting evolutionary implications to thinking about what those regulatory sequences would be doing. And they basically made the proposal that regulatory sequences and protein coding sequences would have differential contribution to adaptations depending on what kind of trait we're talking about. Um, other sort of pieces that, that laid the groundwork here, Britton and Davidson had been looking at repetitive DNA sequences, and they mistakenly thought that these repetitive DNA sequences were in fact regulatory elements for, for regulating transcription. That turned out to be wrong. 
But they put the idea out there that we have now a molecular substrate we can begin to look at and think about gene networks and how they evolve. And that, for the time, was very forward-looking. Of course, the most famous paper in 1975, King and Wilson, based on protein comparisons and the limited degree of divergence between humans and chimpanzees, proposed that the locus of, of, of the, the material basis for the difference in, in traits would, resolve, would essentially resolve to be um, regulatory. And then in 1983, Raff and Kaufman's book kind of showed us how to get there. Because these were all breathtakingly um, uh, uh, dataless propositions. Right? Okay. And so they were visionary, but they, weren't, they didn't give us a research agenda. And it was really the Raff and Kaufman book that kind of gave us the, 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 the blueprint for how to go about doing this. And it was about that time that we had the tools at a molecular level to begin to really do this. OK, so now I have to tell you a little bit about development. Development really, um, a lot of things happen. Cells divide, and they get different. And there's two steps that really, re I mean, all of development, all the complexity of development really boils down to differential gene regulation and that differential gene regulation accomplishing two fundamental things. Cells gain identities so that even though they look the same, they are actually functionally different because they are different instantiations of gene expression programs. Okay, they're all the same genome. We figured that out a long time ago. That was a big debate for a while, but nope, they've got the same genes. It's really 100% about differential gene regulation. And then, because of that differential gene regulation, other sequelae happen, and the, the programs of differentiation emerge, and the cells take on different physical and um, uh, uh, often uh, other kinds of characteristics that result in, in, the, in division of labor in multicellular organisms. And just to give you a visual um, impression of how beautifully, exquisitely precise these expression profiles are, these are snapshots of Drosophila development. And these are not cartoons. These are real data. Um, Multi-gene uh, in situ hybridizations done um, in Ethan Beer's lab by David Kosman. And every color here is a different gene. And you can just see these are single cell wide. These are beautifully precise. And they're transient. If you look 15 minutes later, it'd be different. This kind of precision and complexity requires an enormous apparatus within the genome. And that is the cis-regulatory elements that, 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 that turn these genes off and on in very precise patterns. Just a, a side view showing uh, the, the identity of segments being assigned differently. And ultimately, of course, one, and that's the specification process. That's telling a cell what it's going to become. But they still look the same. But ultimately, they end up being different. And that's what's shown here. These are all human cells. And you can see, again, it's the same flipping genome, but they're really, really different. And that is achieved, again, through differential gene expression. Um, now, the other thing that developmental biologists sort of figured out um, around the same time is that, that it's really important to think about how genes interact with each other. So you, even though we find these genes through forward genetic screens, we characterize them independently, we really need to start thinking about how they work in pathways and ultimately really in networks. And all of this is the prelude to thinking about why regulation is important in trait evolution. Oh, so that makes this, right? That's kind of cool. And these are, in fact, I mean, these are pretty much the major players. And that's sort of neat that we can do that now. OK, so um, now how do we know it's all regulation? Um, we, we don't, it, of course, it isn't all regulation, and it isn't all non-coding change, but a lot of it is. And, and the reason we know this is from a set of experiments that have occurred largely outside of the evolutionary biology literature and are not really well known by evolutionary biologists. But, um, uh, and there, are, there are, are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of experiments like this that I could have shown you. But here's a gene called scallop. There's the mutant phenotype. You take a fly that has no scallop gene, and you take a human ortholog of the same gene, and it rescues the phenotype um, pretty much perfectly. Okay, so none of, the, none of the differences between your copy of scallop and a fly's copy of scallop really matter for the way development works. What matters is which genes scallop talks to. Okay, so it's the rewiring aspect. And then the same, here's, here's actually a case of a duplication. Of, of a gene, and the ancestor before the gene duplication can actually fully rescue both of the, both of the duplicates, and you get, you get a nice development, this time from Hydra. OK, so um, because of the question Hopi asked this morning, I, I put this up. Because I think if you ask a developmental biologist, would you expect certain traits to be the result of changes in certain kinds of genes, or even certain kinds of mutations in those kinds of genes, they would go, duh. 
and they would do something like this. This is very fast, so because um, I just kind of put it together. But and I think one way to think about this is that, that many developmental regulators are what you might think of as trait neutral. Okay, they're just a switch. So if I if I go to Home Depot and I buy a switch, I can hook it up to a fan, I can hook it to a light, I can hook it to an air conditioner uh, or stove, and it can turn any of those things on and off. It's trait neutral. Okay, the fan and the light are like the structural genes that are getting turned off and on. And in the course of evolution, we know that many of these regulators, kinases, transcription factors, ligands, receptors, and so forth, have been massively reassigned to different targets. We know that happens. It, it, is, it is the way genomes are rewired. So we know that. And so we could think of them, in a sense, as somewhat trait neutral. Now, of course, they have history, so their biases in what they can do. But they're, they're in principle, pretty trait neutral and actually in practice close to it over at least long evolutionary time spans. On the other hand, a lot of structural genes are either trait biased or trait universal. And the distinction here is that um, if, you're, if you're thinking about something like secondary metabolism, pigment synthesis, um, a variety of things like that, uh, transport of, of nutrients, um, ion channels, molecular motors, and so forth, these are often trait biased in the sense that a molecular motor is going to affect certain kinds of traits, and it just can't affect other kinds of traits. It's somewhat dedicated. Okay. And then there are things that are universal to every cell. The cell doesn't have it, it dies. Okay? It's got to be able to do glycolysis. It's got to be able to divide. It's got to be able to scavenge and turn over dead proteins. If it can't do those things, it can't function. And so those are trait universal. The, these kinds of traits that encode these kinds of proteins could potentially affect those genes could potentially affect any trait. Okay? So there is a triage sort of system. And there's also a system you could think about whether something's coding or non-coding, whether it affects splicing, whether it affects transcription, whether it affects, you know, there, there are all kinds of, of, of simplistic but frameable predictions that one could make. Um, if, those, if what I said is true, you should expect to see some signatures in the genome. I'm not going to show much data from my lab, but this is one of two slides that we'll show. We just a scan for selection using some of the kinds of methods that we've heard about earlier today. This is an interspecies scan that just basically asks where are there signatures of, of positive selection genome-wide in either coding or non-coding, non-coding being red, coding being blue. And I know Hopi hates it when I show this slide. But, um, and, and I don't even know if it's really true. It's just what we have. Um, we tried to make the test as fair as possible. And there's, there's clearly a difference in both the distribution and the quantity of, of where selection, positive selections inferred to have occurred during um, the, the time that's elapsed since the chimp human ancestor and humans today. OK, so here's what developmental biologists feel like they can bring to the table. Development is the connection between genotype and phenotype, by definition, real broad sense development. Okay. And it, it is a process of regulation. That's, that's what it is. It's really regulation of gene expression, fundamental. You might imagine a universe in which that weren't true, but, and, and I, I think it would be hard, actually. And I'd actually really be interested if people could think of a way you could accomplish development without differential gene expression. But, but, the, but the fact of the matter is, we're not in that universe. We're in the universe where, actually, this is the way it happens. So the, 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 the correlate, or the inference from that, is that if you want to change the connection between genotype and phenotype, you're going to do it by tinkering with regulation. Now, you might do it by tinkering with coding sequences or non-coding sequences. You might do it with the splicing. This doesn't say anything about that, but it's going to be regulation. That's going to be a big part of it. OK, so how much time do I have? Two minutes? Ooh, this will be fast. All right, so what are we going to do to kind of affect the merger and move forward and make this a productive um, relationship that's mutually beneficial? Well, one is we've got to ditch our old gene models. I mean, these are really bad. So if you think about the, the gene models that population geneticists use, that's the gene model. It's 100% abstract. It's, and, and that's because when they were formulated, we didn't know what a flipping gene was, right? So, um, so this model dates back to the 40s, OK? Quantitative genetics, it's not even really a gene. It's just a location in the genome. And quantitative genetics, until quite recently, has been completely neutral about to what that was. It wouldn't even have to be a classical gene, right? And molecular, and that dates back to the 50s, or actually a lot earlier, if you really want to push it. And even molecular evolution, which you think would be like hip to this, no. Their gene models pretty much date back to 1979, which is that they start with a star codon, they end with a stop codon, there's some codons in between, and those code for proteins, and that's the gene model. And that, that is a, a, a pretty restrictive way of thinking about a gene. Um, this is more like a little bit, this captures a little bit of what a gene really is, 
Um, stuff happens all over a gene. It's a physical platform for molecular interaction. That's how you really have to think about it. It is a locus of many, many, many very specific and precisely controlled intermolecular interactions. And if you're not aware of that, you're going to make some big mistakes in thinking about how the sequence evolves. OK, so what do we have to do? Um, the gene-centric model has served evolutionary biology really well, but I think we all recognize that we have to pop the bubble. And what we really need to do is to put that gene into the context of it's the environment, the rest of the genome. Yeah, OK, I'm just about done. Um, the way that that gene is regulated and its connections to phenotype. The other thing we really need to start doing is not just thinking about genes, but burrowing down and thinking about segregating mutations. Of course, lots of people in this room do that now. Um, but also to think about how that gene compares to all the other genes in the genome with regard to all of the kinds of traits we've been hearing about, the, 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 the site frequency spectra, the kinds of mutations that are there, and the trait connections that are there. Similarly, we need to expand scales to place gene, take genes out of the lab, like the mouse example we heard about, um, where you know, beautifully coddled little mouse might survive if you take out its, its, its ultra-conserved element, but if you throw it back in the environment, it's probably going to die. Um, and we actually have to take the gene down to the level of really understanding the physical chemistry of molecular interactions, because if, again, if we can't do that, we're really not going to understand why genes evolve the way they do. Okay, so um, just really very, very quickly, just to illustrate, I'm not implying nobody does this. People are doing this right now. They're taking very, very integrated approaches that bring in population genetics, evolutionary genetics, molecular evolution, and developmental biology, and put them together. And the sum is great. Wait, how's it go? The total is greater than the sum of its parts. And I will, um, I'm just going to end there because that's, and then we do this too in my lab. Okay, thanks for your patience. Thank you.